السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله رب العالمين والعاقبة للمتقين ولا عدوان إلا على الظالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا ومولانا وقرة أعيننا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وأحل الأقدة من لساني يفقه قولي رب زدنا علما رب زدنا علما رب زدنا علما نافعا آمين الحمد لله we are studying the greatest ayah from the book of Allah سبحانه وتعالى the book of Allah كتاب الله is the fountain head of all knowledge the source of tranquility knowledge thought civilization as muslims we must realize the greatness of the book of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and understand the fact that this book does not belong to the worldly sphere it comes from the heavens so something which comes from above the seven heavens is unique it is the kalam of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and our reform and revival the revival of the ummah depends on connecting with his book as the early muslims connected with it and they took it and made it the source of their thought their aqeedah their practice knowledge the fountain head of hidayah guidance if we want to succeed in this dunya and akhirah as individuals and as an ummah we should follow the same manhaj we ask allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to fill our hearts by the nur of quran and grant us tawfiq of connecting with the book of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the previous two sessions we took a brief introduction about ayatul kursi and from today inshallah we will enter into the tafsir of this ayah and i will try to make it unique understanding the principles of aqeedah and thought from ayatul kursi in today's session we will only focus on ismul jalalah the personal name of allah because this is the first word in ayatul kursi allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says a'udhu billahi minash shaitanir rajim allahu la ilaha illa huwa al hayyul qayyum allahu so this is the first word and it is the personal name of allah whatever comes after this name is explaining who is allah it is the answer to the question so allah then comes uh, the explanation he is he has so and so attributes he is free from deficiencies he is a perfect being he does not sleep so on and so forth but this is all explanation of allah if you remember in understanding the greatest knowledge in islam which is knowledge about our creator we said we have two uh, perspectives number one in understanding allah is the that of allah the being of allah the that of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the being of allah regarding the that we said it is above aql no one can understand the essence of this that 
But in that, we only engage in understanding the evidences of his existence. And we said evidences are rational and textual. Or we can say the evidences are in the book of nature, al kawn which Allah has created, and in the text which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed. Because both come from Allah. This universe which we live in, the great design in it, the great justice and equilibrium in it, it comes from Allah. And the book of Allah, Quran, it also comes from Allah. For this reason, the verses in the Quran are called ayah, which means sign. So the signs are in the recited word of Allah. Ayatullahi al-matluwa. And the signs of Allah are in the universe, which is seen, which is perceived, because both come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In at the realm of that being of Allah, we only discuss about evidences. And remember this, this is one of the most important points we must understand as Muslims in our times. That we must take our methodology and thought from the Quran. So when we say rational evidences, where do we take the rational evidences from? Do we take it from science, from Greek logic, from human thought, whatever it is, with its diversity? We can benefit from that. Or do we take it from the Quran itself? We take it from the Quran itself. Quran has its own methodology. Quran has its own terminology. Quran has its own way of explaining the concepts. This is what I mean by connecting with the book of Allah. So if I want to understand the rational evidences for the existence of God and the oneness of that God, God exists and God is one, I must understand it from the Quran itself. Quran contains some deep rational arguments for the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Quran has its own manhaj. As Muslims, we must learn to appreciate the manhaj of the Quran, understanding the way Quran uh, expresses the concepts. It is all unique. The concepts, the methodology of explaining those concepts, evidences, whatever. Okay? So, and then we said, we have the sifat of Allah, which are the attributes okay, or the names and attributes of Allah, because every name contains an attribute and every attribute is necess not necessarily a name. We will come to that. And we talked about how to engage with names and attributes as a Muslim, practically. On theological level, how to understand? It is a different story. But as Muslims, practically, how to engage? We explained in the previous uh, session. So this was about the muqaddimah, the introduction, and some points about which we must understand as Muslims about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, let's come to Ayatul Kursi, the first name or the or, or this ayah begins by Ismul Jalala. We call the name of Allah, Allah, we call it Ismul Jalala. Never be afraid from Arabic. Arabic is a very really deep and unique language. You can master at least the basics in six months if you give a serious effort. And then you learn you need a lifetime for going deep into this ocean. Okay. For this reason, I always 
in my Durus, I connect my students with the with our legacy, the original Arabic terms, uh, reading a hadith in Arabic, ayat of the Quran, so that at least this becomes an encouragement for us to connect with our religion in its original form. Because translations and uh, second-hand sources, secondary sources, they always come with distortion. Ismul Jalala, Ismul Jala Lati. Ism is name. Jalala means glory. And at least this is the best translation we can do. Glory. Jalal, glory, exaltedness, highness, perfectness. This is Ismul Jalala. Why? Why is it called Ismul Jalala? Because all names and attributes of Allah, they return to this one personal name of Allah. Okay. When we say, for example, Ar-Rahman, the most merciful, this name only contains Rahma. It gives the meaning of Rahma. And other meanings of the attributes, they are not contained in this name. This is only about Rahma. When we say, uh, Al-Qahar, the dominant. This name gives only the meaning of Qahar, dominance. It has nothing to do with Rahma. It has nothing to do with other names. So on and so forth. But Allah gives or contains the connotation of all names and attributes. So we can say all names and attributes, they return to this one name. That's why this is the personal name of Allah. Like as human beings, we have a personal name. And other things, other names, they may be our nicknames or they may be based on our attributes, on our qualities. Okay, so my name is Shu'aib. If we have to describe Shu'aib or Ibrahim, we say Ibrahim. So we begin with the personal name, is so and so and so on. Right? So we don't say, for example, Ar Rahman is uh, Al Qahar, Allah. We don't say that. Because Allah is the personal name. That's why it's called Ismul Jalala. Ayatul Kursi begins with Ismul Jalala, the name of Jalala, the name of glory, the personal name of Allah, to which all other names and attributes return. For this reason, there are scholars who say that this is the greatest name of Allah, by which if you ask, Allah will grant you. Ismullah al-A'zam, the greatest name of Allah. Scholars have disagreed about that. But according to one opinion, they say this is the greatest name. Why? Because if you make dua or you use this name in your dua, in your practice, as if you are asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by all names and attributes. Why? Because all these names and attributes, they return to this one name, Allah, with agreement. And this is a good reason to believe that this is the greatest name of Allah. Because when you ask by Rahman, you're only asking by Rahmah of Allah, mercy of Allah. When you ask by uh, Tawwab, you're only asking about Tawbah or the quality of Allah in forgiving the sins. When you ask by the name Al-Wahhab, you're only asking by the quality of bestowal, Allah bestows, Allah gives. But when you say, Ya Allah, you're asking by, uh, the, by all qualities, all names and attributes of Allah, because they are contained in this name. That's why some scholars, they say, this is the greatest name of Allah. So remember this, Jalal. If you, uh, in the previous session, we said uh, the names and attributes of Allah can be broadly classified into two types. Asma'ul uh, Jamal and Asma'ul Jalal. The names and attributes of beauty and the names and attributes of glory. Beauty, rahma, mercy, forgiveness, uh, forbearance, jalal, punishment, dominance, so on and so forth. Here it is jalal, dominance, greatness, highness, exaltedness. Ayatul Kursi begins with jalal and ends with jalal. So the beginning is jalal, the end is jalal. Because it begins with Ismul Jalala and it 
ends with two names al ali al azim we can call it tawqi al jalala tawqi al jalala signature of jalala signature of glory because ali ulu means highness exaltedness akbar allahu akbar and we are exalting allah understand the concepts of our religion engage with these concepts in a deep way don't fall into superficial and naive understanding this is what is destroying us as muslims so akbar is not in body sun is big and allah is bigger nauzu billah allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not a body with the agreement of scholars akbar refers to exaltedness so when in prayer in qiyam we are in qiyam we say allahu akbar allah is above allah does not need our ibadah allah is self sufficient allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not need us how good i become it does not increase increase anything in the dominion of allah how evil i become it does not decrease anything in the dominion of allah and then i go into ruku allahu akbar sami allahu liman hamida sujood allahu akbar a person may think oh in ruku maybe i am near to allah more than in qiyam in a physical sense in sujood a person may say well i'm i think more near to allah in physical sense to remove these wrong ideas the sharia the messenger of allah prescribed this zikr allahu akbar allahu akbar whatever you think how good you become whatever are your thoughts allah is above that okay this is the hikma we know the hadith in which the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that a musalli a muslim when he prays the nearest to allah he is in his sujood in sujood this does not mean this nearness is not nearness of a physical nearness this nearness is uh, the spiritual nearness because allah is not a body why is a person very near to allah in sujood we are near to allah in salah because we are praying but in sujood why more because in sujood sujood is the realization of our existence what is that we are weak we are in need we are not self sufficient we are ibad we are abd we are slaves and allah is lord sujood is the manifestation of this weakness because we are laying the best part of our body which is the face on ground acknowledging this weakness acknowledging the fact that i am a slave i am nothing this is the core of devotion to allah that's why the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said we are near to allah in sujood okay not in qiyam because qiyam contains shubha mixture of yani qiyam means standing a person feels that i am standing on my legs i have and it may make a person arrogant that's why these forms of ibadat have been prescribed in the rituals in order to understand so ayatul kursi begins with ismul jalala so jalal glory of allah and it ends at jalal the two uh names of allah al ali al azim al ali al azim azama azim great greatness highness ali ulu highness greatness exaltedness glory okay so we can say ayatul kursi teaches us about the jalal of allah about the glory of allah ayatul kursi is about learning the exaltedness of allah how is allah high how is allah great how is allah exalted because exaltedness this highness means we don't attribute any imperfection to allah 
we don't attribute any deficiency to Allah. Allah is the perfect being. Allah is the best in his names, in his attributes, and in his actions. So Allah is Ismul Jalala. If you remember, we pointed to the meaning of Haya, life. Because the next two attributes or names are Al Hayyul Qayyum, Al Hay, the everlasting. It points to Haya, which means life. And if you remember, we talked about the context of Surah Al Baqarah. Uh, the story of the cow, which is about life from death. Uh, the two stories of the Ayatul Kursi, story of Ibrahim salam with Namrud, and the story of the pious man. We said uh, in some narrations, the scholars they say it was Uzair. Salam. Again, both these stories are about giving life after death. Okay, because this is one of the main attributes of exaltedness and glory of Allah, giving life. We talked about uh, this. Al Hayyul Qayyum, Al Hayatul Kamila, the most perfect life belongs to Allah. And all life in this universe is connected with uh, Allah. Al Qayyum, Al Qayyumiyatul Tamma, the best Qayyumiyah, the best uh, dominance. Glory, establishment belongs to Allah. So Qayyum is the one who himself does not need any, anyone else for his life. He's established in himself. He is self-sustaining. He is above everything. He does not need anyone. And at the same time, he is Qayyim. So Qayyum and Qayyim. He holds the universe. He is engaged in this universe. So our God is not like the God of Christianity, for example, who created the heavens and the earth in six days and rested on the seventh day, as the Bible says. Allah does not need rest. Rest is from the attributes of weakness. We need rest as human beings because we experience fatigue, which is weakness. Allah does not need rest. For this reason, Allah emphasized in Ayat Kursi and other ayat of the Quran, that drowsiness and sleep does not touch Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah does not sleep. Allah does not even feel the drowsiness, which is the beginning of sleep. And uh, in another ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala negated lughub from himself. When Allah created the heavens and the earth, ma masana min lughub. Lughub did not touch me. Lughub means uh, fatigue. Let me give you the ayah number. This is to negate the concept Christianity in the Bible. Allah created, God created heavens and the earth in, in six days and rested on the seventh day. That's why uh, they have the day of rest. Yawm Sabt, Sabbat. The Jews, on that day, you have to rest. It is the day of the Lord. Because Lord rested, you also rest. You don't do any worldly activity. And this is their concept. What does Allah say in the Quran? In Surah Al Fatir, uh, Ayah 35, Surah Al Zariyat, Ayah 30, no, sorry, Surah uh, Qaf, Ayah 38, Surah Qaf. Ayah 38. Allah says, I will be the Rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wala qad khalaqna as-samawati wal-arda wa ma baynahuma fi sittati ayyam. Fi sittati ayyam wa ma masana min lughub. Lughub. Allah says, and we did certainly create the heavens and earth and what is between them in six days. And there touched us no veriness or fatigue. In the Bible, God created heavens and the earth in six days and rested on the seventh day. Here Allah said, وَمَا مَسَّنَا مِنْ لُغُوبِ yani Even uh, small uh, fatigue. Surah Tuqaf, Ayah 30, 
eight. These are the great concepts and knowledge Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to teach us in Ayatul Kursi so that we understand our Lord, our Master, our Creator. And this becomes the foundation of our Iman. And eventually it will affect our behavior. This Iman will become a good tree which will bear good fruits by the permission of Allah. Tawakkul on Allah, reliance on Allah, living a life which is God-oriented, in hardship, difficulty, calamity, connecting with Allah, hope in Allah, fear of Allah. These are all thamarat of Iman. And Iman is ma'rifah, understanding. If you don't understand Allah as he has described himself in the book and here in Ayatul Kursi, your Iman will not be founded on strong foundations. And the fruits will be, this, this tree will not bear fruits. So whatever we learn, whatever we understand, it is all connected with uh, our life. Allah, Allah is the personal name of Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now let's try to understand the meaning of this word Allah, which we all Muslims repeat uh, numerous times every day in Adhan, in Salah, in Dhikr, in Dua. We say Allah, Ya Allah, Allahumma. But our problems as, as, as Muslims is we don't go deep into understanding our religion. This is our problem. Sometimes it's sufficient to reflect on the simple du'as and azkar and the words I'm saying as a Muslim every day. If we reflect on these simple du'as and azkar and the terminology, we can understand Islam in a better way. But reflection is the condition, a tafakkur, which is a great ibadah. Tafakkur, reflection, properly thought, thinking is one of the greatest ibadat. We know the Prophet ﷺ before he was bestowed with prophethood, he would go to the cave Hira and he would worship there. And what was that worship? Reflection on Allah, reflection on uh, the condition of the mankind, reflection on his own nafs. The ibadah which the Prophet ﷺ would do in the cave of Hira was tafakkur, tadabbur. So we should also foster tadabbur, tafakkur, and reflection. Now let's uh, go to the meanings of Allah. This word Allah is mushtaq, mushtaq. Mushtaq. Mushtaq means it has a root word. From this root word, it has been coined. There is a difference of opinion between the scholars of Arabic language about this word. Is it mushtaq or jamid? I will not go into the technicalities of that. This is not a lesson about Arabic language. Mushtaq, we will take this opinion because this is the soundest opinion. That this word is mushtaq. It has a root word. Now, what is the importance of understanding the root word? It helps in understanding the basic meaning or different shades of meaning. Whenever you read any word in the Quran, if you understand its root word, you will understand the meaning of that word in a better way. This applies in Arabic language or all terms and concepts. What is the root word of Allah or what Allah has been uh, derived because ishtaqa means to uh, separate something from another thing or to take something out of another thing. So Allah has been taken out or coined or made from which word? They say it is ilah. Alif, lam and ha. So alif, 
لام انها الى whether in whether we use it in nominal sense or verbal sense يعني we use it as a noun or a verb for example uh, if we say ilahun ilahun means god plural is aliha alihatun gods so now this is noun ilahun noun we can use it in verbal form also we can say aliha a li ha ya lahu ya lahu now this is a verb this is past tense and this is uh, present and future tense because present and future in arabic we show it with only one word so this is madhi and this is mudhara like for example we say uh, a ka la sorry a a ka la means to eat so a ka la is he ate ya hu lu ya hu lu he is eating or he will eat he will eat in future okay basic verb basic verb in arabic is trilateral means it is composed of three letters easy to understand so the basic construction is fa a la fa a la this is the basic verb in arabic uh, after that it has types has many types new alphabets are introduced we will not go there they say allah is derived from ilah whether we use it in uh, nominal form as a noun or we use it as a verb so ilah means god aliha means gods aliha ya lahu means to worship aliha he worshiped ya lahu he is worshiping or he will worship okay we have another opinion here of a great sahabi who is one of the best scholars of quran abdullah ibn abbas radiyallahu anhuma abdullah ibn abbas the cousin of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is one of the best scholars of uh, quran why because the prophet made dua for him he became a great scholar because he would serve the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam one day in a battle abdullah bin abbas he prepared water of wudu for the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam ablution and when the prophet came back he saw the water prepared everything he asked who prepared this water they said abdullah ibn abbas your cousin radiyallahu anhu he was young he is from the young sahaba the prophet was pleased and he made dua for him he said allahumma faqihhu fi ad-din o oh allah grant him more understanding of religion wa allimhu at-ta'wil and teach him interpretation of the quran give him knowledge of quran uh, reflect on the first dua first part of the dua allahumma faqihhu fi ad-din o oh allah grant him more understanding why did i translate it as more understanding because as if the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was saying this khidma the service which Abdullah, Abdullah ibn Abbas did preparing water of wudu for the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. This is from the understanding of Deen, practical understanding. The best understanding of Deen is understanding the maqam of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, the great station of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, respecting him, revering him, serving him. Now we cannot serve him physically. Serving him means serving his sunnah, applying his sunnah. Uh, preaching it so on and so forth abdullah bin abbas whenever you see his opinion on any ayah take it without a second thought it, you will always see his opinions deep about the book of allah because of this dua he became a great scholar of quran there are other scholars from the sahaba but he he was the most prominent he says ilah means dhul 
ilahiyya ala jami'i al-khalq. Ilah means the possessor of ilahiyya on all creation. So Allah is the possessor of ilahiyya on all creation. Khalq means creation. Jami is all. Ilahiyya means dominance or we can say deity, ilah. The one who is worthy of worship. So Allah is the possessor of this right over all creation, which means he is the one worthy of worship. All creation should worship him alone. This is a specific meaning of uh, ilahiyya or ilah by Abdullah ibn Abbas radiyallahu ta'ala anhuma. We say may Allah be pleased with them both because he and his father both are sahabi. Abba is cousin of the Prophet and his father Al-Abbas is uncle of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Okay, so this is the meaning of ilah. Ilah means deity, the one worthy of worship, the one who is dominant over all mankind. It also gives the meaning of rububiyyah, rabb, creator and sustainer. For this reason, you will see in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has always connected uh, uluhiyyah with rububiyyah. Yani, why is Allah deserving to be worshipped? Because he is the only creator. Or he has created you, he has created this universe, he is the only creator, he is the only sustainer, so you should worship him alone. Allah connects rububiyyah and uluhiyyah. Allah is the only ilah worthy of worship because he is the only rabb. This is the meaning. For example, in the Quran, the first obligation in the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in Surah Al-Baqarah. It is the first obligation. Worshipping only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In that also, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has connected uh, rububiyyah with uruhiyyah. Listen to this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Baqarah let me give you the ayah number Ayah number 21. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhan nasu abudu rabbakum alladhi khalaqakum walladhina min qablikum la'allakum tattaqoon. Allah says, Mankind, worship your Lord who created you and those before you that you may become righteous. See how Allah has connected ibadah with creation. Ya ayyuhan nas, O people, u'budu rabbakum, u'budu ibadah, rabbakum, your rabb. Okay, so why is Allah worthy of worship? Because he is the creator. And then Allah explains this quality of creating. The next ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, الذي جعل لكم الأرض فراشا والسماء بناء وأنزل من السماء ماء وأنزل من السماء ماء فأخرج به من الثمرات رزقا لكم فلا تجعلوا لله أندادا وأنتم تعلمون Again, at the end, عبادة Allah says, He who made for you the earth a bed spread out, 
and the sky a ceiling, and sent down from the sky rain, and brought forth thereby fruits as provisions for you. So now this is creation. This is the manifestation of Rububiya, the creating power of Allah. At the end, Allah says, so do not attribute to Allah equals while you know that there is nothing similar to him. So do not attribute to Allah and dad, nid, equals in worship. Don't worship other gods. Why? Because he's the only Rabb. What does that mean? It means he's the only creator. Okay. And in negating the false gods, particularly uh, the idols, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to again the quality of creating. So Allah says, Allah is worthy of worship because he is the only creator. And false gods besides Allah are not worthy of worship. Why? Because they cannot even create a fly. You understand? This is what I mean when I said that Allah connects Rububiyyah with Uluhiyya and Uluhiyyah with Rububiyyah in the Quran. For example, in Surah Al Hajj, Ayah 73, in negating the false gods, Allah says, Ya ayyuhan nasu duriba mathalun fastami'u lah, inna alladhina tad'una min duni allahi lan yakhluku dhubaban wala wijtama'u lah, wa in yaslubhum al-dhubabu shay'an la yastanqidhuhu minh, da'uf al-talibu wal-matulub. O people, an example is presented. So listen to it. Indeed, those who invoke besides Allah will never create as much as a fly. Those who are worshipped besides Allah, they don't have this attribute of creating. They cannot even create a fly. Even if they gathered together for all that purpose, if they all gather together, they unite all false gods, all people, they cannot. And if the fly should steal away from them a tiny thing, they could not recover it from him. Weak are the pursuer and the pursued. Both are weak. Those false gods and the people who are worshipping them. Again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is resorting to the argument of connecting uluhiyya with rububiyya and rububiyya with uluhiyya. That's why I said ilah also means rabb. And rabb also means ilah because it's interconnected. And this is one of the best evidences for uh, the for this great right of Allah that He is the only being to be worshipped. If you are worshipping other than Allah, they must have created something. You look around; have they? They cannot even create a fly, so don't worship them. Okay, and also it gives the meaning of shukr because ibadah is shukrul munim. Ibadah at its core is uh, gratitude to the bestower of blessings. Because he is the only creator and he's sustaining us. The blessings which we have in our life, he's the only bestower. He deserves to be worshipped. He only deserves to be worshipped. As simple as that. Now coming to the meanings of ilah. This is one of the meanings, Dhul Ilahiya, which means worthy of worship. Are there any other meanings of ilah? Yes, there are. The scholars have mentioned uh, diverse meanings of ilah. And by this, the root, we can understand the meaning of Allah. But here I have picked 10 meanings. These are the 10 meanings of Allah or ilah. Remember these 10 meanings. And some scholars, they compiled it in form of poetry. And I have emphasized on this many times, uh, compiling knowledge in the form of couplets, poetry, in order to memorize it. This, this was the manhaj of the scholars. I will write it in the form of poetry here in Arabic, but we will point to the meanings. Those who want to memorize in Arabic, in order to memorize it once for all. Like we memorize an ayah, we may not know the meaning of every word, but it, it becomes easy. Uh, one of the scholars, he says, خذ معاني 
ilahin ashratun bila ishtibahi bila ishti ishti bahi khudh maani ilahi ashratun bila ishtibahi they have to maintain the rhythm ha ha khudh take the meanings of ilah which are 10 without any doubt what are they minha from these meanings are or these meanings are ala let me write this in a different color so that it becomes easier ala wa hujiba hujiba fazi معه معه طربا حجيبا طربا عبد تحير وطن ولا واحتاج واحتاج سجين واحتاج سكن yes these are the 10 meanings of ilah or we can say these are the 10 meanings of allah the first is ala the first is ala which means highness or exaltedness highness refers to the perfection perfection of allah whatever we think about allah allah is higher than that his names his attributes his af'al are all perfect so for example highness in af'al highness in actions of allah means Uh, that only good comes from Allah. Evil cannot be attributed to, the, to Allah. Whatever Allah does, it contains wisdom. And this is the meaning of highness. Then we have hujiba, which means hijab, wheel, or concealment. Gives the meaning of concealing. And say wheel. or concealing allah is allah is concealed allah is uh, in hijab there is a famous hadith in which the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said hijabuhu an-nur the hijab of allah because allah is in hijab we cannot understand the essence of the that of allah yani we cannot understand the kun essence of the that of allah it is above aql because allah is in hijab we can only understand concepts and things which are in space and time which we can perceive things which are beyond that we cannot understand like the nature of our soul we cannot understand because it does not belong to space and time we can only understand that it exists we know that soul exists but what is the nature of soul is it a body is it energy we don't know for this reason when the prophet was asked about the soul allah did not describe it Allah could have described it to the prophet the prophet has the best form of knowledge but Allah did not describe it because we would never be able to understand it with our ukul hai in space and time so when uh, the famous ayah of the quran uh, allah subhanahu wa taala said yasalunaka an ar-ruh qul ar-ruh min amri rabbi they ask you about the soul say the soul is from the command of my lord full stop why because you cannot understand the nature of the soul allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only focused on the existence of the soul the soul exists you must purify it you must understand its qualities you must not make it filthy so on and so forth same applies on the that of allah when we can't understand the nature of a being which is nearest to us our souls are nearest to us how can we understand allah who is the creator the master of the heavens and the earth 
Okay, so hijab. The Prophet said, the hijab of Allah, hijab, the veil of Allah, hijabuhu nur. The hijab of Allah is nur. <laughs> Subhanallah. Yani, our deen is so great. Deep concepts, ilm, knowledge. What is the nature of hijab? When you put wheel on something, you uh, pull the curtain on the window, what happened? Darkness. You want to create darkness. If you have a candle and you close it from all sides, you put a hijab on it, whether it's a wheel or something, you cover it. Uh, there will be darkness. So hijab means darkness. Hijab does not mean nur, but the Prophet ﷺ said, the hijab of Allah is nur. Allah is the brightest reality in the heaven and the earth. Don't think nur is like uh, the light of the bulb. So we see the light of the sun, the light of the moon, the light of the bulb. We say the light of Allah is maybe brighter than this, but the same light. No, it does not mean that. In the Quran, when Allah said, Allah is the nur of the heavens and the earth. It does not mean Allah, his being is nur. This ayah means Allah is munawwiru samawati wal ard. Allah has lightened the heavens and the earth. This is the meaning. Don't think Allah is like a physical light. Nur does not mean, when referred to Allah, it does not mean the physical light. Quran has its own terminology. Okay? Try to understand the language of the Quran, the language of the Prophet. It is in Arabic, no doubt, but more meanings. Different shades of meaning sometimes. The Prophet said, Hijab nur. The hijab of Allah is nur. Allah is the brightest reality. And when something is very near to you, you cannot see it. In both situations. If something is very far, you cannot see it. If it is very near to your eyes, you cannot see it. Allah is so near that this nur, this, 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 the, the great, greatest reality is his hijab. Hijab. And if Allah remo removes this hijab, the light of his blessed face will burn whatever comes in front of it. This is a famous hadith. You can just Google it, you will find it. So another meaning of uh, Allah or this word ilah is what? Hijab. With all its connotations. We will not go into the explanation. Let us grasp the words and meanings first and then we can go into the explanations. The third is fazia. Fazia means awe. Uh, yani, this is a, the best translation I could find. Awe. Sense of awe. When you see something which is wonderful, which is great, and it's pleasing to your heart, it's pleasing to your eyes, it's pleasing to your akal, you have this feeling of awe. Yani, wow. Greatness. Fazia. This is another meaning of ilah. Taraba, tarab, means strong inclination. Strong inclination. Or shawq, strong desire. Strong desire, which is accompanied with uh, astonishment. Yani when you see your parents after a long time and you're not expecting them or you see someone, your, your beloved, you're not expecting him uh, and you, ha you had a strong desire, inclination towards this person, you wanted to see him and you see him suddenly, this is the condition of tarab and you are flying in happiness. Ilah is also tarab, strong desire. Anyone who's connected with Allah, he will feel strong desire towards Allah. That is why the greatest ni'mah for the people of Jannah is the uh, ru'ya of Allah. That they will see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The sight of Allah is the greatest ni'mah in Jannah. When we compare the physical blessings of Jannah, the holes, the streams of milk, the streams of honey, so on and so forth, the, the, the sand would be of musk, the houses of gold and silver, whatever. When we compare these physical ni'am 
blessings of Jannah with the sight of Allah, they are as if it is a dream. The greatest ni'mah of, of Jannah is seeing Allah. Because believers have this tarab, feeling of strong desire towards Allah, obeying Allah, seeing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, connecting with Allah, being with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why the people of Jannah will have this ni'mah, seeing Allah in different times, as mentioned in the ahadith. Allah will, uh, subhanahu wa ta'ala, he will remove the hijab. Not all hijabs. No one can encompass Allah. He will, this is called tajalli in the language of the sharia. Allah will manifest himself uh, to the believers. After Fajr, before Asr, after Asr, in Jannah. It has been mentioned by the Prophet ﷺ with details. So another uh, meaning of ilah and also Allah is strong desire, tarab, with astonishment, with uh, with uh, uh, with uh, shawq, yearning, yearning also, yearning for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Another meaning is tahayyar. Tahayyar is astonishment. Astonishment. Allah astonishes us. His being astonishes us. His, his handiwork, this universe, is it's every juz, every part of it astonishes us. Tahayyar, hayran, astonishment, above aql. And if we reflect on our body, it, it's astonishing. If we reflect, we, we're talking about physical entities. Forget about the soul and other entities, the angels, <laughs> the, the unseen realm, even the physical entity. What we claim to have understood everything of it, like our own body, which is nearest to us, it astonishes, astonishment, the higher. So then Allah himself is, carries this meaning of astonishment, his being, his attributes, his names, his work, his fi'al, this universe, whatever he does. Another meaning is watan. Watan is uh, settlement. Settlement. Settling of something. Yani, that's why we use watan for uh, the place we live in, because we settle down there. We feel at home. We feel comfortable. It's our comfort zone, watan. That's why in Arabic we call it watan. My watan is this country. So Allah is the being where we should settle down. Our hopes, our fears, our aspirations should settle down with Allah, not with anyone else. Wala, I can say, is strong yearning. Okay? It's different from desire because strong desire or tarab is when you have yearning for something and you achieve it. You, you have this uh, experience of tarab. Happiness, great happiness, shawq. But wala is strong yearning. Wala is, you have not achieved him yet, but you are, you have strong yearning towards Allah. And this pushes you to worshipping Allah, to connecting with Allah, to particularly connecting with Allah in hardship, in distress. And this is what explains the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. Whenever he would face hardship, difficulty, the first thing he would do is Pray two rakat and connect with Allah. Wala, bulu' with Allah. Occup occupied with something. We say this person has bulu' with this, uh, with this uh, action. He's occupied with it. He's always doing it. Wala. Another meaning is ihtiyaj. Ila, ihtiyaj means need. Everyone is in need of Allah. No one is self sufficient. And only Allah is al-ghani, self-sufficient. Okay. The last meaning is sakan, which means, which also gives the meaning of settlement, but with tranquility. Sukoon. Tranquility. 
tranquility. The object where all find tranquility, where all find sakina. Okay, for this reason, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in explaining the uh, tranquility, he said it's only in the dhikr of Allah that nufus, the hearts find rest or tranquility. You will not find tranquility in anything else because the soul comes from Allah and Allah is the master of the soul and the body. It finds rest only in its master. So how many, uh, now how many meanings do we have? Allah, highness, number one. Hujiba, number two. Fazi' number three. Taraba, number four. Tahayyar, number five. Watan, number six. Wala, number seven. Number eight. And number nine. Did we miss something? Ala, Hujiba, Fazir, Taraba, Four, Abd. Oh, yeah, forgot this. See? Sorry. This one, Abd. Abada means worship. Abada means. Worship or devotion, which we explained here. Worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So one, two, three, four, five is here. Five is uh, here. The higher is six. Astonishment. Seven is settlement. Wala is eight. And ihtaja is nine. And sakana is ten. Okay, these are the 10 meanings of ilah. And this is what explains Allah. If we reflect on these meanings and try to collect the ayat and hadith about these meanings, you will enter into an ocean of knowledge about Allah. And also, what are his rights? How should we approach Allah? How should we connect with Allah? It's all in these meanings. وَخُذْ مَعَانِي إِلَهٍ عَشْرَةٌ بِلَ اشْتِبَاهِ وَخُذْ مَعَانِي إِلَهِ عَشَرَةٌ بِلَ اشْتِبَاهِ مِنْهَا عَلَى وَحُجِبَا فَزِعْ مَعْهُ طَرَبَا عَبْدٌ عَبَدَ تَحَيَّرَ وَطَنْ وَلَعْ وَحْتَاجَ سَكَنْ After that he says, I did not write other couplets. This is uh, around 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 couplets. Couplet is two parts of the poem. I only mentioned what concerned us. After that he says, if these meanings are considered, understood, grasped, by this we can understand the perfection of Allah. And because of this, Allah is the greatest name by which if we ask Allah will grant us because uh, it contains all the meanings or it comprises of all the meanings of other names of Allah okay so remember this يعني, this is how the scholars, traditional scholars, in our history, in our time also, they organize knowledge. In order to memorize it, grasp it, they organize it in couplets, poetry, which becomes easy to memorize. This will suffice for uh, tonight. Here it's still today. Inshallah, we'll talk about meanings of Ayatul Kursi more in the next sessions. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us his marifa, his knowledge. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from the best believers 
we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us achieve all these meanings of Allah. Understand by understanding them, grasping them, imbibing them in our iman and applying them in our life. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us best of dunya and akhirah, to grant us hasana in dunya and akhirah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by his beautiful names and exalted attributes to cure our sick and to forgive all our debt.